<laughs> Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. You cannot control the future, and you can't change the past. The only thing you can do right now is address the moment. What has the Lord set before me to do this day? Who has the Lord given me to love and to serve today? Where has the Lord put me and given me to be right now? You can't change yesterday, and you can't determine tomorrow. When we think about the past and trying to change it, well, that's a recipe for regret and despair. If you're honest, you know you've made mistakes. You've made foolish choices. You've often elected to take the easy way out rather than the right way. You regret many of the consequences for your actions. And when you look back, your heart and mind are clouded by many thoughts of what if. Of course, that's unknowable and unanswerable. And of course, hindsight, we say, is 2020, which means you cannot change the past, you can learn from it. You could continue to do the same thing that's yielded only failure, over and over, repeating the same mistake. But of course, that leads to insanity. Or you could be a student of history, the history of the church, the history of the world, or even of your own life story. And in so doing, you'll see that your mistakes, your errors of judgment, and the evil in your heart really aren't all that terribly unique. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. The psalmist says that the heart inclines only to evil. Others have faced the same or similar situations, and you can learn from them by listening to them, gaining earthly wisdom, maybe avoiding their end. And so the past is knowable, and what you do about it is up to you. But wait, actually, it's not quite that easy. Sometimes history is obscured by those who write it. Or even more often, it's rewritten to justify what we want to do in the present. And you even do that with your own history. Your recollection of events, how things transpired, it's not always accurate. It's often faulty. You remember things differently than they actually happened. You can't recall your emotions on that day, the reality of the moment, or any, even some of the insights you might have gained. Because your mind, controlled by your sinful heart, twists and shapes your memories to rationalize what you want to think, who you want to be, and what you want to do today. So even looking backward, as much as it can be known, is not without its own difficulty. But even more impossible, of course, is looking forward. No one knows what tomorrow will bring. Jesus even said that he doesn't know the day or the hour that he'll return in judgment. You spend every day, though, working for tomorrow. You probably look at the weather predictions to lay out your day or even the week. You watch the market trends to see where to invest. You make plans for growth and for expansion. You might even look 10, 20, 30 years down the pike, hoping for the promotion, the success, the big turnaround, or just some sense of peace. But sometimes the signs of the future point in a different direction than where they actually end up. Life throws you a curveball. <laughs> You experience the setback. You're put back on your heels or even just fall down. Jesus today in particular warns you about the futility of trying to control the future. That doesn't mean you're striving for tomorrow, for a good tomorrow, is not itself good. 
But there is no promise in this world, and certainly not even a promise from God that you'll get where you want to go. Yes, it's true, the world will tell you in its books and memes and social media videos that the only obstacle to you getting what you want is yourself. But is that really the truth? Are you the only thing that stands in the way of you being the you you want to be? And is that even really real? Can you actually be anything you want? Do anything you want? Succeed at everything you try? Or is that not, again, the futility of our human heart? Even more so, you have no promise from God of such things. Instead, he gives you to be who you are. He shows you what it is you are to want. He gives success in his way and according to his time. Therefore, all of your hopes and dreams and aspirations really cannot give you any kind of confidence. And Jesus knows this. He knows the heart's condition as well as you do, maybe even better. He knows what it means to go hungry and thirsty, to be stripped naked and thrown into prison, to be persecuted and mocked for your firmly held beliefs, to be spit upon and shamed for who you are, who God has made you, to be accused and condemned by your peers, and to be executed even by an unjust government. He knows your needs. He knows what it means to live in this world. And in the midst of all that, he provides. That was what he was speaking about today in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that, of course, look to the birds of the heaven, see how God feeds them. Or look to the lilies of the field and how God has clothed them even with more glory than that of King Solomon. So why wouldn't he give you what you need for today and tomorrow if he does it for the birds and for the lilies? Why do you doubt that you'll be cared for in the future by your loving father when his son Jesus promises this to you? Jesus tells you exactly why you doubt. Because your emo own emotional reaction and thoughts about your condition, they lie to you about what is really real. You look at your life and you actually tell lies about your needs, actually calling many of the things that you want needs, for example. But think about what Jesus says. He says, are you not of more value than the birds of the air? Have you forgotten that God the Father, Son, and Spirit has given you the highest rank in the entire order of creation? You were given dominion over every living thing, everything that moves and breathes and has its being. And also, in the hierarchy of God's love and care, you matter most to him. He's numbered the hairs of your head, even. And you were made, he says, in his own image, that is, given to be God's chosen representative in all creation. Simply forgotten. But it's not only that. In your baptism, God the Father has conformed you to the image of his son Jesus. That is to say that he's transformed you, remade you, to be once again stewards and loving neighbors of this world and of one another in the way of Jesus. You've forgotten. That's why you don't. So Jesus also says, will God not much more clothe you than the grass of the field? O oh, you of little faith. Again, God has promised to you everything that you need for your body and life, just as he's clothed the lilies of the field. All your life, and indeed the whole history of the world, testifies to the fact of God's ongoing loving care for creation. Yes, we see entropy and decay all around us. That is the result of mankind's rebellion from their creator God. But even in the midst of this decay and death, God provides 
and blesses us with life. He continues to cause the sun to shine, the rain to fall, the seed to sprout, the livestock to grow and mature. He blesses his people, not just with their bodily need, but with marriage and with children and with grandchildren and great-grandchildren, continuing to provide loving, faithful stewards for one another and for all creation. Why do you doubt? If we take Jesus seriously, take him at his word, we have to admit that he is and continues to be generous and rich in blessing. Uh, but it's not that easy, is it? There's plenty to worry about. The future of your country as you know it is probably in jeopardy. The economy, despite all the assurances to the contrary, has every sign of a massive implosion and failure. You're seeing increasing assaults on the family, on the church, on all the institutions that provide social cohesion and unity. Even this Christian congregation, indeed all congregations, are reeling yet from the devastating lockdowns, with many households of our own fellowship continuing to be absent from the divine service. So we have plenty to be anxious about, even fearful. But again, Jesus tells us why we're so anxious. He tells us the source of this anxiety. He says, O oh, you of little faith. Now this isn't some kind of absent promise or empty platitude, just have more faith. He's actually begging the question. It's a rhetorical question. O oh, you of little faith, well, how do I have faith? Where does faith come from? What is needed is not more stuff, God providing more for your bodily needs, and then you'll trust him. As we know from other parables and sayings of Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you have, you'll never be satisfied. What's needed is more trust in Jesus. And today, Jesus tells you exactly where that trust comes from. Jesus tells you how this trust is built and sustained. He tells you how to remain trusting. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. The only way to live without the constant worry, anxiety, and fear of the stuff, of this life, the life in this world, is to live trusting in Jesus, in his righteousness, that is his forgiveness, as it's given to you here in his kingdom. See, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else will be added to you. So if you're going to look at the past, look to Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you're going to look at the past, look at the cross of Calvary, where God proved once and for all his loving care for you and for all people. Jesus died not just to give you more food and drink and clothing and shoes and all the things you need for this life. He does that for you regardless of whether you believe in him or trust in him at all. But Jesus died to absolve you of your sins and he rose to destroy death forever for you. That is to say your entire past as you look to the cross is forgiven in Jesus. And if you're going to look at the future, you can see in the promise, you can see through to the promises of God. Namely, God as he's revealed himself in his word. Here in Jesus' kingdom, he constantly reminds you, assures you, that where there is forgiveness of sins, you have life, not just now, but eternally. As you are already now saved from death, you can rest confident in the assurance of faith, knowing that God will on the last day receive you and all those who believe in, in him to eternal dwellings. Those dwellings he's already now prepared for you and for all those who love him. So if you're going to look forward, if you're going to look to a future, look to the one that he's already assured you has come to pass. 
look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, the one who has promised to you, no matter what you experience in this life, the life to come. And then each day you can live confidently and at peace, knowing that your past is taken care of, all your sins are forgiven, and that your future is assured, <laughs> heaven is yours. Each day you can live then without anxiety and worry, living within the home and the community and here in the congregation that he has given you. You can live each day serving your neighbor in love and without fear, or even worry about how you can provide. And you can labor diligently for all, knowing that you are God's holy instrument, his beloved image given into this world for one another. And you can rest each day confidently in Christ, in his word, in the gift of his baptism, in his body and blood given and shed for you, and in the giving of brothers and sisters together here in the congregation. All of this is going to last long after this world sees its destruction. Or as Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He is your past and he is your promised future. So live in Christ's kingdom and in his righteousness. And then you won't be anxious because your heavenly Father knows your needs and provides everything, not just for your body, but has provided his Son for your faith and life yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Amen.